chapter 4. The seven churches in Asia in the first century lay the groundwork for the conflict the church in all ages and in all places is going to face. The specific struggles, struggles of their time and place as I uh, read them listed like this, the institutionalized worship of the state through the cult of the emperor, pluralistic relativism of pagan polytheism, economic pressures to religious compromise in trade guilds, social ostracism, and random harassment from pagan, from Jewish quarters, love lost uh, amid the theological conflict and external adversity, complacency amid accommodation and influence. These are many of the exact same strategies the enemy continues to use to assault the church of Jesus Christ while the devil's power to deceive the nations is restrained until just before the very end. The coming visions in Revelation will present the climax of the enemy's assault as a multi-headed dragon who summons a multi-headed monster from the sea, a second monster who emerges from the land to deceive the earth's inhabitants, and a harlot who is arrayed in luxury but is drunk on the blood of Jesus' martyrs. What Revelation makes clear to us is that a church under these kinds of threats doesn't just need directives from her king on what to do, she needs to see his splendor and know what he is capable of. The one who sees the church and walks among her, cleanses her, makes her stand. So just who is he? It's almost like we revisit tonight the, the, the splendor of chapter one amplified almost in the middle here. His final promise to the one who conquers these days back in chapter three, verse 21 the climactic promise to the churches reminds us that Jesus is the ultimate victor over the dragon. The conflict the church is engaged in now and that will come, beloved, is so severe that our only hope of victory is the abiding presence of Jesus Christ, our victor. Now, what would encourage the churches to whom John writes directly and ones like ours to which he is writing through the Holy Spirit to persevere in the midst of this world until Jesus finally returns. And beloved, I ask that because what we're about to read in chapter four tonight and chapter five, God willing, next Sunday night are Jesus's answer to that question of what the church needs. What do we need to know? What do we need to hear? What do we need to see? Beloved, we need to know how to worship God in these days. Revelation 4 and 5 are describing what is happening in heaven right now as we speak, not just when John was granted this vision. This is what has been happening in heaven throughout history and is going to continue until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The vision is that of a holy, mighty, sovereign, eternal God who's in complete control of his entire creation, even the forces that are arrayed against him. Nothing on earth is under control, right? Nothing feels like it's under any control. Nothing here makes sense. Nothing here goes according to plan. But John is told through this vision, and so are we. Beloved, things are never what they seem to be down here, ever. This isn't all there is. There are two realities, beloved. There's a visible and a physical, and there's an invisible and spiritual and it's the latter, the spiritual, that rules and controls the physical and the visible. So evil, the enemy, chance, circumstance, time, they don't govern reality. God governs reality. The one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty is Lord over everything. And so a biblical worldview, having a distinctly Biblical worldview depends on seeing things for how they actually are, not how they appear. Dennis Johnson said that the book of Revelation wages war on the reductionism that chokes all. I love that sentence. The book of Revelation wages war on the reductionism that chokes all. We were not given the visions of this book as photographic reproductions of events, just so you and I can sit down and argue over what they mean or what they represent. Our flesh, 
The world and the devil wage war against our souls actively all the time so that we will not be awed. That's the point. So that we will not be awed by the only truly awesome thing that is God himself. To be awed by anything else is to be a victim of reductionism that chokes what you and I were created for. In the worship of God alone, we will find the means to live in this world. By beholding him in worship, we will know what we need to know. We'll hear what we need to hear. We'll see what we need to see. To see God exalted and enthroned as he is in heaven right now is to be reminded that things are not as they seem here. It is to be given a glimpse of reality so that we may endure as the church of Jesus Christ in this world. Let me pray and we'll look at the text. Father, we thank you tonight for the authority, inspiration, and perfection, and inerrancy, and infallibility of your holy word. God, open our eyes tonight to see, to know, to hear. God, this glimpse we've been given into heaven in Revelation chapter 4. God, let the text do what you intended it to do by the power of your spirit. God, awaken our souls. Give us life according to your word because our souls cling to the dust. Raise us up tonight, Father. Let us see. Let us be enthralled. Let the church know who you are. Fresh and new. In these days, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Let me read, I'm going to read the chapter. It's only 11 verses in its entirety, and then we'll break it down. If I break it down, just, just listen for a minute, all right? And then we'll piece it apart. After this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. It's the voice of Jesus. And I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their thrones before, they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Glory to God. Do you see this picture? Do you see this description, beloved? What are we worshiping? Who is this God? Do you see this? The this is some of the most exalted text in all of Scripture. This picture of the throne. We're, we're being stretched to the limits of our imagination here. It's meant to make us stand back and say, what is that? What does that mean? You ever, you, pictures of angels can be very beautiful, but man, do they reduce what the creatures are like in heaven? I mean, if you, if you, no wonder, isn't it weird that every time an angel appears in scripture, the first thing out of their mouths is don't be afraid. That's because they probably don't look like nice, clean Europeans. They're full of eyes. In, I mean, all over the place. I mean, that's scary. This is an amazing passage. We, we don't have the right language to precisely describe what John saw. Neither did he. In verse 1, after this, John sees a door standing open in heaven, meaning that a new series of visions is coming. It will reveal what must take place after this, he says. 
John saw and heard the Son of Man describes things which are, remember, in his letter to the churches back in 119. Now the focus shifts to the future of the seven churches and the forces that are and will be assaulting them. After this, doesn't refer to the events of the visions from chapter 4 to the end of the book as coming after the events in chapters 1 through 3. The phrase specifically means that a new vision is coming after the previous ones in chapters 1 to 3. John is telling us the order in which he saw the visions, not necessarily their chronological order in history. The second time we see this phrase in verse 1, what must take place after this, you see that twice after this, it refers again to the vision of Daniel 2.28, the wording does, exactly, and following, in which Daniel was prophesying about the latter day coming of the kingdom of God, that John sees clearly as beginning to be fulfilled in Christ, which is how Christ himself, if you remember, spoke of the kingdom, meaning the second phrase, which must take place after this, doesn't refer to the distant future. That's how it was for Daniel to see it. Now it refers to the events between the first and second comings of Jesus when the kingdom that Daniel saw was inaugurated in the coming of Christ, including those events that were happening as John was writing. The after these things allusion from Daniel back in Revelation 119 and its equivalent in chapter 1 verse 1 must soon take place indicated that the fulfillment of the prophecy in Daniel 2 about the establishment of God's kingdom has begun in Christ through the church. So 4.1 isn't just introducing 4.1 to 5.14, although it is doing that. It's introducing the rest of the visions in the book also, 4.2 to 22.5. So all of the visions that are about to be revealed concern events throughout the whole church age, past, present, and future. Some may have already unfolded. Some are still waiting as we speak tonight to be fulfilled, and others are being fulfilled in many different ways throughout the age of the church. This is why the New Testament is so adamant that the last days or the latter days already started with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what's going on in chapter 4 as those days have been ushered in. Acts 2, 17 through 21 cites Joel 2, 28 to 32 as fulfilled. Then you have texts like 1 Timothy 4.1, 1 Peter 1.20, James 5.3, 1 John 2.18, Jude 18, all speaking of these days that began at his resurrection as the last days. It's clear in the text. By the time John writes Revelation and receives these visions, the last days of which they speak have already begun. And it'll be difficult, as we know, from studying a revelation to determine the price, uh, the precise timing of these things. Since to reveal them to us through John, what has had to happen? John has been called up to the timeless dimension of heaven into eternity from which all these visions flow, meaning that past, present, and future are all being spoken of here. Remember that they're, they're not on time in heaven. This is a different realm. This is what's happening throughout time in heaven. The open door, the call of Jesus initiates John's summons as a prophet. Beloved, that's why the language is what it is here. To enter the council chamber of the king of kings, to hear his plans, to hear his purposes, to bring his message to his people. Remember Amos chapter 3 verse 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants the prophets. Isaiah's commission as God's prophet in Isaiah 6 reminds us of this. Ezekiel's commission in Ezekiel 1 both describe their entrance into the Lord's holy place to see his glory, to receive his word. John is blending the characteristics of both of these calls. The point of this language then at the beginning of chapter 4 is specific in context. It's to establish that John is an authoritative prophet of God that this revelation is the kind God gives to his prophets so they might deliver it to his people. Again, he's been taken up into this timeless dimension of heaven where truth and reality can be clearly discerned. That's why in verses 1 and 2, John identifies himself again with the prophetic authority of the Old Testament. That's what we're reading in context. This text doesn't direct us to see the phrase come up here in verse 1 
and John's spiritual rapture of going up in verse 2 as symbolic of the church's physical rapture before the tribulation. The text on its own here doesn't teach this because it isn't the point of the wording here. In other words, that's a complete imposition on the text. Maybe somehow to explain what is allegedly the church's absence between 4 and 20. But we don't get that from the text. It's, it's read into it, right? That doesn't come naturally from this at all. The scene in verse 4 describes heaven and the throne of God throughout the church age. So the church is present. The church present in chapters 1 through 3 is still present as the visions in chapter 4 begin. They are whom he's speaking to as though they also are going to experience this and this is going to be a part of their lives. In fact, the order John describes here, this is why we must know the prophets clearly in order to properly understand Revelation. The description of the throne, then the revelation of the one who is seated on it, that echoes Daniel's vision of the Ancient of Days from Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And it will be repeated again in Revelation in the vision of the martyr's thousand-year reign later in chapter 20, verse 4. What do we see? God is seated on his throne. The first glimpse of heaven John receives here as a prophet is of the enthroned one who is sovereign, has the right and the power to achieve his purposes. That's the picture Jesus wants John to see. Regardless of how rampant evil becomes, John, this is how things actually are. Church, this is how things actually are. John is seeing. God is actually in control and enthroned above all of it and all of us. This is what a beleaguered church of Jesus needs to know as they go into these days that bring about the end. Look at verse 3 again. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. That's not what they are. That's not what God is. It's what it appeared to be. He appeared to be to John's eyes. We should read Revelation like this. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Part of the point here is, so don't mess with him. Right? Don't mess with him. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. John describes the reflection of the glory of God's beauty as though it's like light refracting in jewels, right? He who sat on the throne had the appearance of jasper. Jasper is an opaque stone. Uh, they're usually red. They can also be yellow, green. They can even be like a, a grayish blue sort of color. In Revelation 21, 22, jasper portrays the majesty of God. This is John beholding the majesty of God. He also had the appearance of carnelian or sardius, it's a red stone. It's almost like a ruby, right? And there you're getting a, a picture of God's wrath, his jealousy for his own glory. He'll accept no rivals. Then around the throne, John saw a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Where have we seen a rainbow in Scripture? What did it mean? This is reminding us of God's faithfulness to Noah, his promise that he wouldn't destroy the earth again by a flood. This speaks to God's mercy, God's loving kindness, loving faithfulness. And John is just caught up here, literally and spiritually. He's just caught up. He, he doesn't know how to describe what he's seeing, so he uses words that we can relate to. doesn't mean it isn't real. It's absolutely real and absolutely literal. He just is using human words to describe a heavenly scene. How many rainbows that you have seen appear to be emeralds? They're pretty multicolored, and yet the rainbow John is seeing, he, it has the appearance of an emerald. It almost has a greenish, he doesn't have the words. Storm says, this is where worship begins. When we see God as he is, sublime and sovereign, we will worship and praise him. Beloved, this is not a picture of a God who's wringing his hands with anxiety over whether or not he's going to be able to get a handle on this world. So you and I can differ over the details here. That's fine. 
But can we all agree? Our God is not stressed. All right? He's not stressed. He reigns in indescribable sovereign majesty and glory. And you and I, we're going to be just fine. This is a beautiful picture. He reigns on his throne. Chapters four and five bear witness to this. Before we get into all the details, John is not, again, John is not saying that God is a Jasper or a Carnelian. That's not how the visions work or that God is a rainbow. He's saying he had the appearance of them. God looked like that to John. So John is not writing it with photographic reproduction. This is symbolic imagery. Again, that doesn't mean it isn't literal. Of course it's literal. Of course the Bible means what it means, right? John is trying to literally describe what he's seeing, and these are the words that he has. This is meant to set our minds on fire, right? That, that's really the purpose here, I think, of Revelation, more than it is for you and I to know every single you know, jot and tittle of this thing. It's, it's to stand in awe and majesty of this God, knowing who it is that is over us as we enter, as we live in the last days, maybe the capital L, D last days, you and I. That very well could be the case. It seems like the case. We're meant to stand in awe of God's wonder, beloved. Let's just start there. Let's just start there. The worship that lifts our hearts to heaven is impossible without genuine wonder. I'm saying, if the picture of God doesn't amaze us, we're not going to be partaking of the worship that God is designed to steal us in the last days. I think worship is the means by which we endure. All beholding his glory. But there has to be a sense of wonder there. And, and, and you, it's hard to stand in wonder of what you don't know personally, right? It's, you almost have to ask in the context of Revelation, is this practical though? Right? Is it practical to contemplate the magnificence of God on his throne? That sounds very super spiritual. It sounds very out of touch with reality. It sounds like what you would do if you didn't care about the world, didn't really understand how things worked. How does a vision of the magnificence of God on his throne help me deal with my boss? How does it help me deal with my spouse? How does it help me deal with my own sin? I mean, John is the last living apostle. He's, he's exiled. He's literally dying. Why, when what he really needs, we would think, is, is practical step-by-step -step encouragement that's real life, why does God give John a vision of his glory on his throne? That's not real life. No, 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 beloved. You say that. We say that because we don't understand reality. This is the only thing that makes sense in this world that no matter what is happening, this is what is happening in heaven. This is the way things are. The seat and source of reality, it looks like this in the midst of all that's going on. God enthroned in glory on the seat of sovereign authority in the universe, unmoved, reigning, and glorious. That's the vision of God. We need to restore our sense of reality to restore our sense of what really matters and what is going to last forever. Worship is meant to connect our soul to the transcendent power of Almighty God, to awaken us again and again to see his beauty and his glory, the glory of God that transforms us, that makes us who we are. Now look at what surrounds this glorious throne. Look at what surrounds it. Look at verse four. Around this throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. So first things, God is described as being at the center of all this glorious heavenly worship, isn't he? He's surrounded in almost um, like ever widening concentric circles the throne is surrounded by a rainbow in verse 3, but then by 24 elders on 24 thrones, then by four living creatures on each side in verses 6 and 7. 
Later in chapter 5, next week, we'll see that he's also surrounded by a myriad of angels and then finally by all of creation. And beloved, all the focus of these circles is on the center, is on the throne. That's as it is in heaven. In heaven, everything, including creation, is how it should be, right? All focused on the one who sits on the throne. 24 elders or 24 thrones, 24 elders seated on them. Who are these 24 elders? They're described as wearing white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And verse 4, there's other people in scripture described that way. Think about that for a minute. Who else is described in language like that? They bow prostrate before God in worship. They cast their crowns down before him. Other people are spoken of as doing that or they will be doing that. They sing songs of praises to him. In chapter 5, we learn that they also hold the prayers of the saints in bulls to present to God the Father. So who are they? Some say they're a higher form of angel, right? They're just a, a, like another order of angel, like the cherubim, the seraphim seem to be a, a different order, a higher order. Um, since they're pictured as giving up our prayers, they're uh, several times in Revelation when these elders actually interpret to John the meaning of the visions he's seeing. They join with the four living creatures and the rest of the angels in worshiping God. But nowhere else in Scripture are the angels referred to as elders. And even more so, usually, beloved, it's the people of God, it's the church, the redeemed, who are depicted as wearing crowns, clothed in white, sitting on thrones. Remember, Jesus promised to, to sit with him on his throne at the end of Revelation chapter 3. See, remember that. End of chapter 3, you get a vision of the throne, and in 4 and 5, you get a clear vision of the throne. It's almost like the theme is sticking for the church that he was writing to in 2 and 3. Others believe they're exalted Old Testament believers. After, where do you see the number 24? David organized um, the temple into 24 orders of priests, so there's some precedent there, at least the same number. Others say they're actually exalted New Testament saints who've gone through great tribulation, given their lives for the faith. Now they're in the presence of God. I think, I think we get the best sense of their identity from their number, the number 24. That's very specific. And so I agree. My take would be they are a reference. The 24 elders stand as a reference to the 12, tri 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the church. In other words, the elders are angelic beings who represent the entire community of the redeemed from the Old Testament and the New Testament, doing what the church was created to do, worship around God's throne. Uh, in the letters, remember, in the seven letters to the churches, the angels were identified as representatives of the seven churches. In Daniel 10 through 12, there are angels who represent nations, right? So this does seem to be a task of certain angels. They bring the prayers of the saints before God. In chapter five, they sing of those who are redeemed in the third person. So I don't think they're literal saints. It, they speak of the redeemed in the third person. God has redeemed them, not God has redeemed us. The elders don't sing us, they sing them. In chapter six, they're explicitly distinguished from human beings who are saved. And so these are powerful, powerful angelic beings who are representatives of all believers seated around God's throne. No wonder then, uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, Christ can speak of us as being raised up with him, seated with him in the heavenly places, right? These representatives of us there speaking to our spiritual position, our reality. And these elders, what are they? Mesmerized by God. Mesmerized, as we'll see in a few moments, look at verse five. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Again, just this scene is amazing. Sometimes in contemporary places of worship nowadays, people use smoke machines. You know, they use strobe lights. Have you ever seen this, you know, maybe on a a concert or, and, and, and that I'm not, I'm not really, my purpose really is not to knock it. I'm, I'm simply saying if, if, if we think we can by these contrived things imitate heaven, beloved, that there's not a smoke machine up there, right? That there's, there's nothing plugged into the wall, right? That this, 
These things emanate from the glory of Almighty God Himself. Right? Nothing here is synthetic. This is, this is just God in His glory booming out like thunder. That, that's, that's what it is. Smoke just emanating from the essence of God. This is powerful. We, we can't, in other words, in our worship, we want to partake in this and we can, but we can't reproduce what's happening in heaven with earthly things. We simply cannot. This is the essence of worship, the glory of God in its fullness. A fundamental reason we gather as Moundsville Baptist Church every week, beloved, has to be to be reminded of this heavenly reality in Revelation chapter 4. That should be intentional. We want to take part in this. We want to exalt God on the throne and his lamb. And notice again the description of the Holy Spirit here that mimics what we saw back in chapter 1. Seven torches of fire, seven spirits of God. Again, there are not seven Holy Spirits. All throughout Revelation, the number seven symbolizes perfection, completeness. This then is a sevenfold image of the absolute divine perfection of the one Holy Spirit of God. And there was a sea of glass like crystal, like what Jesus turned the Sea of Galilee into when his disciples were afraid. A heavenly sea so peaceful, a sea, it's vast, it's not a lake, it's not a pond. I mean, how big is this, what John is looking at here? A sea of glass like crystal. A sea so peaceful it looks like a shining sheet of glass. Here on earth, the sea is chaos. We haven't even gone as deep as we think it goes. We haven't even explored all of it. There, the sea is still and clear in its perfection around the throne of God. Massive, massive. Look at the second part of six. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, so now they sound like the seraphim in Isaiah 6. And notice they're going to sing the same song. Are full of eyes all around and within and day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy. A threefold repetition in scripture means that's as much of that as it can get. So when later in Revelation, when we read, woe, 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 it's awful. Here, God is holy, holy. Holy, holy, the essence of holiness, the source of it, the definition of it is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We're going to get a lot of that forever imagery of God in Revelation chapter 4. All, so also around this throne, so we have the rainbow, we have uh, the elders, now we have the four living creatures, angelic beings of yet another kind why four? What's the significance of four? In Revelation, the number four is usually a symbol for the created order, four corners of the earth, right? The four winds of the earth or of heaven. And notice their characteristics. Notice how earthly they look to John, right? The, the, they are there to symbolize that all of God's created order stands in awe of him. Again, it doesn't mean he didn't see literal beasts, he, living creatures. He did. I'm saying he's trying to describe them with earthly words, right? Like is his word, like a lion. So it looks like a lion. It's not really a lion. It just looks like one, etc. The qualities in verse 7 all signify something about the God these creatures worship. The lion speaks of God's royalty, God's power, the ox of his strength, the man of God's intelligence and creativity, the eagle, the swiftness of God's actions, the swiftness of his words. If you've seen an eagle in flight, you can begin to picture how these creatures are operating. There were four living creatures seen by the prophet Ezekiel. Do you remember this? But the major difference between Ezekiel's vision and John's of the four living creatures, beloved, is the absence of the wheels 
when you read John's vision. In Ezekiel, there are wheels, not in John's vision. Ezekiel's vision was for the purpose of what? Assuring the Babylonian exiles from Israel that even though the temple had been destroyed, they'd been deported, they'd been moved out of God's holy city, the Lord was not going back on his promise to be with them. I move with you wherever you go, wherever you are. So you see wheels. Here in John's vision of heaven, there are no wheels. Here the meaning is God's glory is immovable in its essence. God isn't going anywhere. It's fixed. Nothing can challenge him. Nothing can change him. Nothing could damage him. And, and really, um, who would fight with these four living creatures? Who would fight with him? Who would attend, uh, attempt to assault the throne? Full of eyes around and within, letting us know that God is omnipresent. He sees, he's omniscient. He sees, he knows everything. Beloved, remember, a suffering church is getting this vision. So look behind the curtain tonight. You'll find something better than Toto. Look behind the curtain. Look at how tranquil and how fixed and how majestic and how glorious God's sovereignty is over the turmoil happening on planet Earth. Imagine reading chapter four in the Roman Empire as a believer in Christ and, and realizing, oh, that's who's really in charge. That's what's really happening Look at verse eight again. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Day and night, just picture that. The four living creatures and the 24 elders never cease to say the same thing. We get annoyed when a chorus repeats more than twice. Right? We do. Never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. The four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever. Thanks for what? Beloved, for being God. He is worthy of our worship before he does anything for us. He's, war, he's glorious and worthy of praise and thanksgiving just because he is. And beloved, every time these four living creatures do this, which remember is all the time, they never cease day and night. Whenever they do this, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. The worship of God in heaven is endless. It repeats Beloved, and it isn't repetitious. Does that make sense at all? It isn't laborious. Just as there is constant eternal punishment in hell, there is constant and eternal praise in heaven. Remember this text. The next time we get annoyed, if our worship through singing or through listening or whatever it is goes longer than we want it to. Beloved, look at him. Look at him. We... 30 minutes is too long to sing to him? Oh, beloved, what are we missing? What transcendency are we not getting because we're always doing this? Day and night, they never cease. Is a longer time of singing, if that's what comes, is that really a struggle? Is it really a struggle? Now, look, I'm not trying to excuse dumb, empty repetition. Because there's nothing worse than repetitious worship when the subject of all the verbs is us. I praise you, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. Take it up an octave. I praise you, I praise you, I praise you. I, oh, okay, great. That's great. You're singing about yourself. You're the subject of that sentence, right? We, we listen, I know that the, 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 uh, you know, the correlation is kind of weak, but listen, we don't get annoyed generally at a three hour football game. We don't get annoyed at a four hour race. And that's just guys turning left at 200 miles per hour for four hours. And there are people that like, you can't make fun of Jeff Gordon around my mom. She will cut you if you make fun of Jeff Gordon. She, I know he's retired, but my mom, she has a whole room since we moved out 
You know, as the kids, they, my, my dad has his little room. My mom has her little room. Her room is Jeff Gordon and Ohio State. And if you make fun of either of those things, you will pay. She's dead serious about racing. So, you, we, But we're, why do we not get annoyed to sit and watch something for four hours? Because we're awed by it. Beloved, I'm, I'm not saying you have to have a four-hour worship session when we gather. I'm, not, I'm, I'm simply saying, how can we hear of this and see it and not stand in awe of it for a little bit longer than maybe we're normally comfortable with? Look at what one commentator called this glorious redundancy in heaven. I mean, all the elders do apparently is fall down and get up so that at the next round of singing, they can fall down again. Isn't it interesting that we think in order to show reverence, what do you have to do? You have to stand. In heaven, they fall down again and again and again. And it's not any nonsense like being slain in the spirit, right? Remember, we can't imitate heaven here or, or replicate heaven here. We can imitate it. We can't replicate it. So it isn't that. It's showing you the greatness of God and the priority of worship that again and again and again, these 24 elders whose existence is around the throne of God, that's not easy to hold. What do they do every time they hear this song? They fall down. They fall down. At the very least, in our hearts, we ought to be face down when we sing, when we worship God, whether it's through singing, praying, giving, listening to the message. Beloved, you're worshiping right now. Do we understand that? That, that right now my goal is to paint a picture of God that makes your heart stand in awe of him. Glorious redundancy in heaven. This is what it, in other words, this is what it looks like to be overwhelmed by the majesty of God. So if worship gets on our nerves after a while, we're going to be pretty miserable in heaven. And I don't think anybody in heaven is miserable. Heaven is a place, the throne of God is a place for people that are mesmerized by God, right? And the worship of heaven is what? It's exuberant. It's enthusiastic. It's loud. Of course, style is always a matter of preference. Don't uh, you have your own style and that's okay. Each one of you has a style of music, for example, that you prefer. Totally fine. Nothing wrong with it. So do I, right? Style is a matter of preference. And there is certainly also a place for quiet reverence. There are styles of music that don't lend themselves to worship. I don't debate any of that. That just are irreverent in their sound even sometimes. But when we consider that there are own preferences, or when we consider having preferences, we just need to have them shaped by the whole of Scripture. Not just the parts that seem to talk about what we like. And look at the focus of the worship in heaven. It's his holiness in verse 8. Clearly, hearkening back to Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy. His sovereignty, Lord God Almighty. And his eternality, who was and is and is to come. No beginning, no end. This vision is meant, it's given to inspire confidence in God's control of time and history. To tell us why we aren't foolish to stand in the face of suffering and persecution. It's the only thing that makes sense if this is what is reality, right? Not how it looks down here, but how it's going up there. These hymns tell us the point of this vision and the point of the chapter. That's how the hymns they're singing operate here. God is worthy of glory because of his holiness, his sovereignty, and his eternality. I didn't say immortality. That's to be born and never die. Eternality is to have no beginning and no end. These creatures then are performing the function all creation was meant to fulfill. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven, Jesus tells us to pray. Well, how is it in heaven? Like this. Like this. The elders are doing what the church was created for. The angels are doing what they were created for. But this isn't only meant to be carried out in heaven, but carried out by the church here on earth. How much thought and priority go in to worship? Right, this specifically our time of singing and celebrating God in that way. 
parenthetically here real quick, and I really am almost done. I have one more page here, all right? That's what I hope to be able to accomplish in hiring a worship pastor in this coming year, if we vote on that and it passes. A pastor for worship whose task it is mainly to design and structure our corporate worship together so that every time we gather, Sunday morning, Sunday night, even Wednesday night, we might grasp what God is truly like. I think that takes time. I think it takes a person, at least one person, focused on it. I just, I just, I want us when we gather like this to know the transcendence of our God, to just be reminded of it again and again. Because we all, you get in ruts, we get in ruts, and we're just cranking out services, right? And, and in one way that I don't mean to make that sound so, you know, pedestrian. I, I don't. It's a, it's a privilege to gather with the saints. It's always wonderful. But what if there was more for us? And I'm not talking about emotions. I mean depth. Okay. We can crank up emotions anytime we want. I'm talking about depth here. What God intended is that every time we behold him, and his work through his son were moved so that all we can do is worship. The things of earth fade away for those moments. It's just God in his glory and his transcendence. And it wouldn't matter if everything was on fire around us. He's on his throne. He reigns. That's what worship is meant to do. That carries you and I from Sunday to Sunday. It'll carry us when we have our last Sunday together and we're not allowed to meet anymore. And we got to gather wherever we can find. We'll need God to be transcendent and big and surrounded by a sea of glass and creatures covered in eyes and all this. We will need that. We will need him. And he's there, beloved. He's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. Look at these majestic beings. Look at these majestic beings. Hear all this worship. Hear all of this praise. See the refracted light. See the sea of glass. Hear their song in verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The worship of God in heaven is geared towards the constant realization that he is worthy to receive glory and honor and power because he created everything, and by his will they exist and were created. Isn't that backwards? How do you exist before, how do things exist before they're created? All things existed in the mind of God before they were ever created, beloved. Behold him. Just behold him. I mean, uh, mountains, dogs, right? Alligators. You, I mean, just goodness sakes. Love, right? The... the the way your wife looks coming down the aisle to you, right? The, 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 this, this, is, this existed in God's mind before he ever made it with the word of his mouth. Behold him, worship him. God is being glorified because he's the sovereign judge and redeemer over creation. From its conception or inception to its passing and to its ending. Why would God have John and the church Get immersed in the details of this chapter. What good does this do me? Beloved, beholding reality is the key to faithful Christianity. To our faith, to our endurance, and to our holiness. Namely, beholding the majesty of our God. It is transformative and transcendent just like he is. John was given this vision from which all the details of Revelation will now flow so that he and the church would walk away from this chapter into their lives, and I'm quoting here, spiritually dazed. God wanted to give us such a grasp of his greatness and majesty that we would literally live every moment in awe of him. That's who we are. This vision is in Revelation. It's in Revelation that you get these details. This vision was given so that we would conquer the last days. So if you ask God, how do you keep your people going? I show them myself. <laughs> it's amazing. To see God exalted and enthroned as he is in heaven is to be reminded that things are not as they seem here. It's to be given a glimpse of reality so that we may endure as the church of Jesus Christ in this world. 
Beloved, to be spiritually stunned by God is to not be easily overtaken by this world. Where else are we going to go? After reading this, where else would you want to be? Who else would you want to be your king? I mean, what else would you do but throw all your eggs into this basket? Right? I, I, I feel like, which I don't like to use that word so much, feel. But I, I, I like to think that that's my point as a preacher, as a husband, as a dad, which makes me instantly think of how much I must repent for not being, but, but what if my task is just to, for, to speak in such a way that others behold him and stand in awe of him and what that could create? I trust it. I trust it. I trust it. I trust the glory of God in Christ. I trust it. I want to trust it. If we could constantly hear this song, the voices of the world would get quieter and quieter. They wouldn't be so loud. This is loud. Hear this. What will it take for us to actually be freed from the confines of our own hearts and be liberated from the pull to sin and liberated from the pull to idolatry? How will we endure if the enemy's worst efforts that are yet to come, come about in our days? How will we do this by seeing God in his majestic, sovereign, eternal glory, beloved. So if gathering as a people, whether it's in here or in Wednesday nights or in groups or in Sunday school classes or just in fellowship and even fun, what if everything was structured so that more than anything we beheld him? If we were just reminded of Revelation 4 and 5 again and again and again, in our lives. We were meant to be captivated by this greatness, beloved. Captivated. What if that's the thing that breaks the chains of sin and worldliness in us? What if that's the thing that breaks the chains of doubt and unbelief? What if it was beholding him? I mean, goodness, we tried everything else. We were meant to be captivated by his greatness, this greatness. So, beloved, Behold your God. Behold him.